cells. Our cells have a DNA polymerase that has a structure almost identical to the beta clamp. Almost identical to it. Saying that this function of holding the polymerase close to the DNA is an essential function that's been preserved through evolutionary history. We have a beta clamp just like E. coli has a beta clamp because it's important for holding that there. It makes for a much more efficient type of DNA replication. If things are falling off, then it's got to come find another DNA uh, molecule, and it's got to bind to it, and it's got to start the whole process all over. Once it gets on and stays on, that's very, very important and useful for the cell. Beta clamp makes sense? Yes, Iris. It's holding on polymerase 3. So polymerase 3, the, it's, it's part of polymerase 3, but it's holding the rest of the proteins all together right there so it can replicate. Yes, sir. How does it get off when it finishes the circle? That's a very good question. And I, I'm telling you a little bit of a lie. I said it comes all the way around. It turns out that we have bidirectional replication, so they actually meet down here, if we think about going on a circle. And the place where they meet is called a termination sequence. You don't need to know this, but the termination sequence has some specific DNA sequences in there that tell the polymerase, you're done, get out of the way. And that's what, that's what happens at that point. Okay, now, there's other proteins. You think, oh boy, we've got all so many things to learn. And yes, you do have to learn uh, what these proteins are doing. So let me show you some of the other proteins, all right? Okay, now, um, one of the proteins that's there is called SSB. SSB stands for single strand binding protein. Single strand binding, SSB. SSB is very important. Because if you look at this point in the replication, you see single strand here and you see a single strand here. This cell is very, very vulnerable at this point. If I break this strand or I damage this strand, then that's going to show up in what this is being made. If I break or I damage this strand, then the same thing is going to affect this bottom one that's going here. One of the cells would get damaged as a consequence. So to one of the functions of SSB is to protect against damage. It's protecting that single strand from getting damaged in that short period of time before the DNA polymerase can come along and replicate it. OK. Now, there's our friend DNA gyrase. What does DNA gyrase do? Anybody? What does it do? It's what? So it's affecting the supercoiling. It's, it's, it's preventing knots from becoming a problem. Now, I haven't told you about how knots can become a problem. That's the, that's the function of the last protein I'm going to tell you about. And it's a very, very fascinating protein, I think. Okay? It's a protein called helicase, H-E-L-I-C-A-S-E. Helicase is doing an essential function for the replication. What the DNA polymerase wants is it wants to have single strands for it to copy. It doesn't do very well at pushing the strands out of the way. It simply wants to have a single strand here and a single strand here for it to copy. And that's what it's striving for. Well, how do you get a duplex apart? In the laboratory, we get it apart by boiling it, but that's not a very practical way inside the cell to happen. So E. coli, and our cells have a, have a very similar protein, has, an, has a, an enzyme called helicase. And its job is to peel apart the strands. It actually does it by rotating. It rotates and pulls the strands apart as a consequence of that. Now, this helicase has an amazing ability. Okay, I'm going to lead you through it here. What's the amazing ability? It's unwrapping DNA, right? Well, I said it's, it's rotating as it's doing this. Okay? I told you that DNA replication was occurring at the rate of about 1,000 nucleotides a second. That means that the DNA polymerase is making 60,000 nucleotides per minute. Okay? 1,000 per second translates to 60,000 per minute. If we think of 10 base pairs per turn of DNA, which is approximately right, that means that 6,000 base pairs of DNA are being unwound every minute. 
That means that, that protein is rotating at the rate of 6,000 RPM. Helicase is rotating and unwrapping DNA strands at the rate of 6,000 RPM. That's faster than the motor in your car. That's a phenomenal rate. Yes, it takes ATP. It takes energy to do that. It takes a decent amount of ATP. It's one of the reasons that DNA replication requires a lot of energy. And you can imagine when it's peeling apart the strands, now you're creating tension ahead of where you are. That's why the DNA gyrase is located ahead of the replication part, because that's where the tension is that if I don't untangle that, if I don't release that tension, I'm going to have a knot. Pretty cool, huh? We have a very similar setup. We have proteins that have different names and so forth. And I'm going to point out some differences in our replication later. But this, the basics of replication in our cells and in E. coli are the same. Yes, sir? What causes it to rotate so fast? I guess it's, it's structure. Uh, it's, it, if it doesn't rotate that fast, then E. coli can't replicate its DNA fast enough to support replication. Um, but uh, I, I, I'm not a biophysicist, so I can't tell you the structural component that would do that. But um, what it does, it's an odd, and I, I, I've seen the mechanisms, it's an odd shuffling mechanism that it uses back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Um, but it's, it's, it's pretty hard to fathom. It's like I say, the nanoscopic world is very different than we imagine the real world here. It really is different. Yes? Good question. It turns out we don't replicate um, uh, at, at as fast of a rate as E. coli does. No, we don't. And that's partly because we have all these proteins that we've got to untangle and everything. So it's much more complicated replicating in our cells than it is replicating in E. coli. Very good question. Um, but nonetheless, it's, it, 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 replication still proceeds at a fairly rapid pace. OK, how are we doing? Let's see. I think I've got everything. Uh, Yes, we're all there. OK. What's that? Does it introduce a new mechanism for doing that? No. It's because the polymerase is the only thing that's going to drop or do whatever with that. Polymerases do make mistakes, and polymerases do drop things out, but there's nothing new uh, that, that, that I've introduced here. No. OK. Let's see. Um, so I've talked about topoisomerase. That's, that's the DNA gyrase. Uh, I've talked about the replication fork. And I've also talked about proofreading. You can now see proofreading going on. So remember I said it backs up a little bit. And when it backs up, it peels off a little bit of that strand. And now it says, oh, we're going to remove this guy and then go forwards. Keep in mind that DNA polymerase is not only replicating at an average of 1,000 a second. That includes the proofreading, the time to stop, to back up, to chew something out, and to move back forwards. Pretty cool. And by the way, I should also point out that I didn't, I didn't point it out here. I'll point it out that if we look at the different activities, okay, DNA polymerase 3 has proofreading. That's really good okay, because that's the main polymerase, polymerase of E. coli. It doesn't have to rely on polymerase 1 to do proofreading. Okay? The proofreading is done also by polymerase 3. Notice that polymerase 3 does not have a 5' prime to 3' prime exonuclease. The only enzyme in E. coli that has that ability is polymerase 1. So if you try to make an E. coli mutant that doesn't contain polymerase 1, what you discover is it dies. And it dies because it has to have that function. You can't leave RNA in your DNA because over time, you're not going to have uh, something that's going to replicate. OK. All right, now let's think about a couple of, whoop. You all right? OK, so let's think about a little bit about uh, repair. And uh, then um, I'm going to talk about um, a couple of the other factors here. So damage happens to DNA over time. One of the things that happens to DNA is uh, chemical damage. So if you are, for example, a smoker, um, or if you live in a place where the air is very polluted, uh, what you can find is that there are what are called DNA adducts. And DNA adducts are chemicals that will, that will covalently bind to your DNA uh, a double helix and stay there. 
Well, you can imagine that you have these great big honking molecules, and most of them are great big honking molecules. These great big honking molecules hanging off of your DNA, when the DNA polymerase comes along to replicate, that may cause some problems, and it frequently does. So cells have mechanisms for attempting to deal with both DNA addicts and other kinds of damage that can occur to DNA. One of those I've mentioned before, and that is tanning booths. Tanning booths use a very short wavelength of UV that does something that really disturbs me. Okay? It does what's called cross-links your DNA. It makes cross-links. What does that mean? It means it's making covalent bonds between adjacent thymine residues in your DNA. So within one strand, within a, within a single strand, if I have T next to T, say I've got T paired with A, T paired with A, these two T's in the same strand, if they're exposed to ultraviolet radiation that comes in a tanning booth, what happens is they will get a covalent bond between them and they will be stuck together. When the DNA polymerase encounters that, or if the DNA polymerase encounters that um, crosslink, it's very likely to either stop replication or make a massive error. And massive could include uh, errors of a few hundred nucleotides because it doesn't know how to get past it. And it makes a guess. It may start inserting things. It may start deleting things. And as a consequence, uh, an error happens. Okay. So it's important that cells have repair mechanisms to deal with those things, those situations. Okay. You okay? Oh, you got stunned. Oh, okay. <laughs> no wonder you jumped. I stunned the little guy, too. You stung him, okay. Yeah. Are you, you hope you're not allergic to bees. No. Okay. okay. Anybody here allergic to bees? Are you? Do you carry stuff? No, not, not, it's not my food. Okay. Because I'll kill the bee if you. <laughs> this bee's going to die. <laughs> I think the bee is he's on his back. I think he's probably uh, done his thing. So, okay. Any entomologists in here? You want to? You, would you like to remove the bee? I, I think we're okay. I think the bee is, is on its last uh, last wings, as it were. Okay. Here's what a thymine dimer looks like. This is what's happening in a tanning booth. It happens to a limited extent in, in UV light out in the sun as well. But tanning booths, because they have such an intense short wavelength of UV light, have this problem happen much more. It's very, very likely that tanning booths are linked to skin cancer. Very likely, okay? And like lung cancer, it's not going to happen when you're at the tanning booth. It's not going to happen when you start smoking. It's going to happen over time. And that's why I say that going to a tanning booth is like starting smoking. It doesn't make any sense to do at this point in your life because all you're going to do is make yourself prime candidate for skin cancer when you get to be my age. You don't want to do that. Okay? Now, these bonds have to be repaired. And your body has a repair system for fixing it. E. coli has a repair system for fixing it. And you say, well, then I'm fine and dandy. If it gets repaired, then I'm fine. Okay? Every repair system has capacity issues. Okay? Every repair system has capacity issues. So if we, have, um, we overload it by all of a sudden getting a few trillion thymine dimers with a, time, with a session at, the, at the, the, uh, the tanning booth, if we don't get those fixed by the time we go through replication again, you're going to have some significant problems. And those, over time, are going to lead to cancer. Okay? So that's what I'm what I'm uh, concerned about here. Okay. Let's look to see how the cell actually uh